Who will get slugged with Australia's new broadband tax? And when will they pull the plug on your old phone line? Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Alcatel. Welcome to Vertical Hold, the tech show where we channel surf through the headlines in search of the big picture. I'm Adam Turner, and I'm joined by a man who says it's not Christmas until he sees Hans Gruber fall from Nakatomi Plaza, Alex Kidman. yippee Also joining us is PC World and Good Gear Guide editor Nick Ross. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Alex, what's new in tech? Amazon has formally and finally launched its Amazon Prime Video service in Australia, and globally as well. For US $2.99, and that's the introductory half price offer, you get The Grand Tour, a smattering of Amazon originals, a few old movies, and a show, and I swear I'm not making this up, called Is It Wrong to Try and Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? Streaming service Foxtel Play is finally available in high definition via the Telstra TV set-top box. Just as Foxtel prepares to kill off its Presto streaming service and encourage subscribers to shift over to Foxtel. At the same time, the ABC has rediscovered high definition broadcasting, with the national broadcaster launching a high def simulcast of its primary channel just in time for the Doctor Who Christmas special while bumping the 24 hour news channel down to standard def. After originally promising them for late October, Apple has finally put its AirPod Bluetooth headphones on sale in Australia. If you want a pair of the tiny but wireless headphones, they'll set you back $229, and if my experience is any guide, people will look at you really strangely while you're wearing them on a train. Australia's internet service providers will be forced to block piracy-related websites such as the Pirate Bay and Solar Movie after the federal court ruled in favour of rights holders including Foxtel and Village Roadshow, who've been demanding action for years. The rights holders will be forced to foot the bill, though, paying $50 per block domain as well as the ISP's legal costs. ISPs have until the end of the month to block these sites and redirect users to a landing page notifying them of the court's decision. So, Alex, Amazon Video is sort of officially launched here now. Uh, Is it worth getting excited about? Well, look, ultimately, at the moment, this hinges on whether or not you're excited about the Grand Tour or not. Um, yes. I don't know, Nick. Are you are you a, 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 a Top Gear aficionado, or were you? I definitely was, and I signed up with the UK account um, when I could, which actually costs about five times more, it seems. Um, but I mean, heck, it was worth it. Um, Grand Tour's looking good. I've only seen the first episode. I gather it's getting better, but um, that's amazing value all over. Well, this so- is the thing. What you're paying for, Nick, though, if you're getting the UK one, is full Amazon. Prime, which is the free delivery in the UK, and actually a lot more video content. Here we've got that much, much smaller library. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and even then, it's good value. Yeah, we still don't even know in Australia exactly what they're going, what we're going to get. They haven't talked about the wider details of uh, Prime, of services in Australia. They've just now said, yes, you can kind of officially launch this, and here are the iPhone and Android apps. And when I asked them, when will we see the Fire TV in Australia? The response was to tell me where they do sell the Fire TV, which is really helpful. So um, I think they're literally yeah. still building their offices at the moment. So it's coming over in some big way. I mean, if we get the store, then that'd be great. But obviously, you've got the distribution problem. But I mean, at least uh, Prime Books could be a good one uh, to come here because there's a lot of titles there and um, our book industry could use some innovation, let's say. So Prime's been in the UK for a while, hasn't it? Yeah, and uh, the US, and you, you get a 350,000 subscription, uh, well, free books if you've got it, and um, two-day shipping uh, guaranteed as well. So, and because everyone buys everything on Amazon, um, then that's a really, really good deal. Uh, See, but yeah, it's that two-day shipping that's going to be a bit more of a killer in Australia necessarily compared to the UK. Well, that, I mean, their online store in the UK is absolutely huge. It sells everything and it's got all the second-hand stuff. It's, uh, it's really, really handy to have. Um, we really miss that in Australia. But, I mean, yeah, tyranny of distance and all, not going to happen too easily. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's be honest here. And we should point out, actually, Nick is, is being brought to you this week from the UK. We're truly global this week. But uh, you could walk the UK in two days if you were really determined, whereas two days would barely get you out of Melbourne or Sydney in you know, depending on your pace. Uh, we're, we're a much bigger country. Um, 
And look, I mean, looking at the the, the, the rest of the news, um, we've obviously got a lot of movement in um, available streaming elsewhere as well, with Foxtel Play hitting the Telstra TV and, in fact, hitting it in HD with live streaming. Um, I'm not a big Foxtel viewer. Are we excited about this? I am. I'm fed up of paying $140 a month for its Foxtel set-top box. Um, I don't know what the channels are. If they've got the sport on there, then great. That seems to be the only thing other than HBO. Um, I'm totally over it. IQ3 is the worst product I think I've ever tested. Yeah. Uh, it's a horrible Satan device, and it's not going to get any better now. Um, and, you know, if we get all these uh, streaming channels working really well on the device, even like the Fetch TV Mighty, I actually love that. If they're all on there, then you don't need Foxtel, and you're saving ooh, almost $100 a month. It's ridiculous. So, Alex, we kind of have a new NBN tax of sorts, something called a regional broadband scheme. What does this mean? Well, at the moment, it's probably worth pointing out, it doesn't mean anything. It means that the government said, oh, well, we're thinking of doing this thing. And if you follow Australian politics, you'll know that what the government thinks of doing on a Monday does not necessarily mean that that's what it's actually doing by by the time Friday rolls around. But the basics of this scheme is that currently the bits of the NBN that frankly were never likely to be particularly profitable, satellite and fixed wireless. And while they mucked around with the fixed wireless uh, broadband map, because originally there were areas that were going to be fixed fixed wireless because of remote locations, there's now some fixed wireless quite close to locations which are not in fact remote. Leaving Mm. that argument aside for a second, um, the idea is that those those bits of the NBN were always going to be struggle to be we're always going to struggle to be profitable because of the nature of the number of customers they had and the cost of delivery, cost of getting satellites up into the air, that kind of thing. So they were always going to be subsidised to an extent by the wider metropolitan user base, which was going to bring in all the money. Yeah. The government is talking about shifting that and instead introduct- introducing a levy to be charged to ISPs for every user that they've got on a service that's 25 meg or better. Now, this applies to both the NBN, which is kind of what you'd expect, although in one of those weird accounting rule things, it gets taken away from their general revenue and shuffled into the way that works. So it's a little bit of a nil-sum game there in some ways. But it also will apply to any other non-NBN provider above a certain size, unless they're shifting their stuff to the NBN, a la Telstra and Optus's HFC networks, or if they've got under, I think it's 2,000 users per month, they'll get slugged $7.30 per line per month, even though they're not on the NBN at all. And of course, a bunch of these things, and the, the, the big players here are, um, uh, are Opticom and TPG with their fibre to the basement products. They exist because of the way that the rules and the regs around how you could compete with the NBN were put in place. But they've spent considerable money building these systems, and they're now crying foul, and it's not hard to see why about how this is actually going to affect their bottom line. But ultimately, even though all the reviews have said, hey, if you do this, consumer prices are going to go up, the government's kind of gone, yeah, look, we know. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. So, Nick, you're a man who's everyone knows has followed the NBN debate over the years. My idea originally was that we build one network, serves everywhere, the city helps pay for the country. We wouldn't need these kind of things. What's changed and why do we need this? Or do I we know. It's like, well, we... we... <laughs> It depends what you look on the NBN for. I mean, it, it was the national broadband network. It was fibre to everything. It was going to revolutionise services for education, health, aged care, business, society in general, and all kinds of things for everyone across uh, all walks of life all throughout Australia. And um, and we killed that. And now it's uh, the NBN TM network, which doesn't actually mean anything, which is just as well because it doesn't actually do anything. And it basically lets you download things a little bit faster. So all the revolutionary services and value have gone. So all the propping up of the rural broadband that the metropolitan broadband users were going to do is massively diminished because why would you necessarily get an MBN connection in metropolitan areas if uh, you if you don't use the internet very much? Mm. Uh, I mean, at least uh, old people who didn't have a computer had high definition phone calls to look forward to and free phone calls at that. Um, that's mostly gone. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's like, um, I, I don't know quite about the finances of this, but isn't it also partly they're trying to get the rural subsidization of metropolitan areas of this weird network off the books, which would make it more attractive to sell to, you know, cherry picking type things down at the, well, 
companies down the line. But then I'm very cynical like that. Um, I would I'm not. I think you, you're not the only one who, who's thought that that this certainly makes the the MBN much more attractive if you're looking to buy it because the the way I've always saw it, as I said at the start, is they've got one network that services everybody. They don't compete with the retailers. They don't compete with your, your Telstra's and your TPG's and your Optus's. They just they lay down the roads and then everybody can use the same roads. But as soon as we threw it out fibre to the premises for everybody and had this hodgepodge network, it created these opportunities for your your smaller players to come in and cherry pick some of the suburbs. Meanwhile, TPG had actually been real, building a rather big network on the side and that create the fact that everyone wasn't getting great broadband anymore created the opportunity for these people to come in. And as soon as they come in and chip away at the re- re- metro areas, they're stealing customers that were going to help pay for the country areas. Is that kind of a, a good way of looking at it? And now they need to balance that out? That's totally it. I mean, it, it was before talking to MBN Co about this, they were very open about, well, the, the higher paying people pay for the lower paying people, but yeah. everyone gets it. Um, because of that and that, that that was that was great it made sense nationwide and any company could come and profit off it um just why would you get rid of that it's crazy so maybe to look at it from a from a post office perspective we've got the thing now that it cost everybody the same price no matter where you are in australia a, a stamp to post a letter even though it costs a lot more to send a letter in regional regional australia than it does in the city but what we've done is we've let other people pick a, pick away at the metro area. So now what we're having to do is charge people in the charge everyone extra for their stamps to help subsidise the people in the country. Yeah, and and the thing is, we were going to open up the country by having these fibre networks out there, or faster networks, and and what have you. Um, and you know, people could um, come here and do a startup in uh, some very nice rural village uh, with cheap land and uh, cheap labor and be very attractive globally. And now we're making it so that it's really hard and more expensive to get broadband out to these villages. <laughs> and it's just making rural life even more, you know, unattractive. It's, it's so sad. It's, it's an incredible missed opportunity. And I mean, I, I, I almost feel like I'm playing devil's advocate here because I think I broadly agree. But the reality for broadband in Australia, if you were regional, was consistently actually that it char- that you were charged more. So many ISPs in the ADSL era that we're kind of getting into the tail end of used to have two sets of pricing. You had a metro price and you had a regional price. And in some cases, you had two regional prices. The difference was, of course, that in a lot of cases, that was because that was what Telstra Wholesale charged. Yeah. Them for those connections as opposed to a government controlled entity. And I mean I it does make me angry because I do feel as though this is this is such a simple utility. And it's a utility even for people who don't realise that it's a utility. Even for the angry talkback listener who might go, Oh well I don't need broadband and people are only using it to pirate movies faster and all this kind of, you know, very 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 easy to spout off stuff. Don't realise the service levels and the other the other things and even just the other efficiencies that it can that it can enable and we've seen so much of that this year in terms of online government services and censuses and the way that they've shifted stuff to MyGov which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't and sometimes the ATO loses all your tax records <laughs> but. If Got my had... fingers crossed there. Got my fingers crossed. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll have to we'll have to wait and see for you know six to seven years from now. I suspect for a lot of people, but uh, but in theory, you could have done all of this stuff, and it's all been kind of kicked away for either financial expediency or political expediency. But I also feel like we've kind of been we've been talking this for some time now, and to a certain extent, I suspect if you're listening to this, we're probably preaching to the converted, aren't we? Yeah, it's basically the chickens are coming home to roost because, I mean, we wrote about all this, what, three, four years ago. We said it would happen because, like, two plus two equals four. And now it's happened and people are coming back to it going and getting angry about it. It Mm. it kind of shows what the environment was back then in terms of politics and journalism. Yeah. So the idea was always eventually to privatise and sell off the MBN, yes? But were they... Are they? Does it look like they might bring that forward or sell it off in bits and pieces? Well, the, they didn't plan on doing it before, but I mean, they could have done it before and it would have been a vast, well, a very, very valuable national asset and it would have basically been sellable for more than it cost to build. Yeah. Now, who's going to buy it? 
it's, yeah, it's a it bit of a clunker. It's replacing already. Um, yeah. they, they've cut so many corners, they might have to re, uh, relay the fiber that they've laid to the to the nodes because there's um, the channel's not wide enough now. Um, we'll find out how bad that is down the line. Um, but, I mean, See, the I can, whole I thing needs to replace it. I can answer this question as to who's going to buy it. Um, who's going to buy the whole thing? And I, I, I think I disagree with you. Bloody but I'd have Telstra, to back isn't it? Well, I was going to say, I think I disagree with you. I'd have to go back and check the uh, the details because I was fairly sure even the previous Labor policy was actually that eventually it'd be sold off. And I've got to admit, I didn't think that was a great idea myself. But uh, yeah, Adam, you've rather stolen my thunder there. Telstra Sorry, is the mate. obvious contender. But frankly, even someone like Singtel Optus would quite happily bid for a lot of it, depending on what price you put on it. Because, well, yeah, Nick, they, I agree with you. There have been bodges, there have been workarounds, and certainly there are a lot of horror stories emerging about people on fibre to the node connections um, having terrible experiences. And this is not just the folks who were, you know, living next door to the ADSL exchange suddenly going, oh, this is no better. These are these are people who had poor connections before and they've still got poor connections. They're just being told, oh, well, this connection's capable of 50 meg, but it's not. But even if you leave that aside, there has been improvement. I mean, fibre has been laid. The network as a whole might be patchy, but it's better than it was. And that's an attractive prospect, especially, you know, if you're a company that's been handed several billion dollars for your HFC network, which may or may not be used, you've got a bit of a war chest. Yeah. And if they're looking for a bit of a fire sale to, you know, prop up the budget or prop up the imaginary budget emergency, for example, then, you know, I... I I, I, I would be stunned if they didn't buy it and if they didn't happily buy it. Oh, there's that. But the thing is, if you're going to buy all the nice fibre backhaul that the public's just uh, paid for, then you're going to have to buy all the copper turd network that connects it to the actual users. And the only way the government's going to make that attractive is by doing some sort of massive discount or offering to pay the maintenance on it. So either way, I, I get it. People at corporates will line up to buy it. This will get the deal of the sadly. century. Both are entirely sadly possible. I could totally see them offloading it and saying, Inevitable. "Oh yes, and the maintenance costs will be covered out of tax." And yeah, Nick, completely. if we ended up, if, Nick, if we ended up selling this thing back to Telstra, haven't we just gone around in a big bloody circle and ended up back where we started? Totally. And we've what? <laughs> of, um, I was going to use a really bad euphemism that I shouldn't do, but I mean that's what sixty million down the toilet, and we're literally yeah. back where we started again. Yes. with just a little bit more fiber. It's, it's crazy. And the other thing with the NBN, of course, that a lot of people are only now starting to appreciate, and again, if you're listening to this, this might not be you, but it might be people you know, your relatives, your parents, whatever, is the spectre of the cutoff date. And I know I've done a bit of this uh, of late, uh, doing radio pieces, and I think, Adam, you've been writing about this as well. It's this issue of when your primarily ADSL services get the snip, because it's roughly 18 months or so since you were told you could get an NBN connection. People are starting to panic about this, aren't they? Well, yeah, people are starting to panic, but not enough people are actually doing anything about it. Um, my understanding is that when they send you a letter and say, you can now sign up for the NBN as of today, they also tell you at the same time, you've got 18 months to do that, and then we're going to cut off whatever you were using before. So if you're relying on, as you say, probably um, DSL over your phone line, you've got 18 months to move to an NBN plan. It doesn't matter which provider you with you can be with telstra or optus whoever you want but move to the nbn and then 18 months we're going to cut that old network off which makes sense because you can't leave the old thing running forever but the thing is that so far only half the people have made that switch and when i wrote about that in the paper and the nbn said oh can you put a few corrections in that story one of the stats they pointed out to me is that 74 percent of people are signing up for an nbn service by the cutoff date now, if you flip that around, that means 26%, a quarter of people aren't even making that 18-month cutoff date. Now, Nick, why do you think that is? It's because they, is it because they don't know, because they don't care? Honestly, I'm not totally sure what's going on here. I mean, before it was very simple. You're getting rid of the copper, you're putting fiber there so your copper phone won't work. Um, now they're leaving the copper phones there, but apparently if you've got an internet service, you have to cut over. But then what happens to your copper phone? I, I'm afraid I, you guys have been following this more than me. I actually don't understand, and it'd but, be one of the things where I just threw the thing away as well. Is that part of the problem here, is that they've all just made it a bit too complicated, and, and all these people who aren't necessarily tech people like us have heard all these arguments about the NBN over the last couple of years, how it's not what it used to be, how it's complicated, and you don't know what you're going to get, and they're all just saying, well, this sounds like more trouble than it's worth. I'm going to just stick with what I've got. Go away. 
Well, it's, it's like what what is being cut over? I mean, if you've got an internet service, then you probably know that you've already cut over. But what what is it? Is it like if you're on ADSL, then basically that will stop working. But yes, if you've got a landline, that will keep working. Um, and that, only well, a landline. Need... But broadly speaking, you need to do both. And I, I mean, I suppose some of that 25%, to give them a small benefit of the doubt, some of that 25% is going to be people who either, they're in a premises where they don't care about that kind of thing. So if you got to add a holiday home, for example, you might think, well, I'll just take my mobile anyway, so I don't care about having a landline. Maybe I don't care about having broadband there. That kind of thing. And some work premises, not all of them, obviously, might only care about part of the equation. I think there's probably also a bit of the what I tend to call the Christmas shopping phenomenon, where everyone knows that December the 25th is coming, but loads of us haven't actually done all of our Christmas shopping. And we'll be yes. out on Boxing Day, uh, on New Year's Eve, desperately chasing around to try and get stuff done. I think there's going to be a fair bit of that happening as well. Um, but I think ultimately it does come down to that thing of a lot of people have just... There's been so much sledging of the NBN concept, there's been an awful lot of mismanagement of the rollout, and this is going back years and years and years, I don't intend this to be a political diatribe, but there's been so much mismanagement of it, and that's been reported on, that I think people are genuinely a bit apathetic towards it, they're just yeah. kind of, oh god, it's this thing and I've got to do it, and I don't understand it, and I don't want to do it, uh, so I won't, and it's only really when they hit that point of, hang on, what do you mean my landline's not going to work, but even there, as a country, we are dropping landlines um, in fairly significant percentages. So the landline side of it, I, I don't know that that's a huge argument. The broadband side of it... The older people, it's a big deal. Because they're not totally, really, totally. There's like, and that, that's a large portion of the 25%, I reckon, you'll find. Another thing that I saw just in the, the comments on the story that I wrote is people saying, well, I'm actually in that 18-month window now, but I still can't sign up because of problems with the MBN in my area. So the clock is ticking, and I'm counted in those numbers, but I couldn't move to the MBN even if I wanted to. NBN not rolled out properly, shocker? I mean, is this well, news? <laughs> well, no. But and I hate I to sound harsh, so. but, you know, no, that's, yeah, not, but an, you that's not an uncommon about. story. Uh, no, it's not an uncommon story. That's the thing. And perhaps this is an, an indication of how not uncommon this is. Um, you sort of hear about patches of it here and there. But, um, yeah, they, they've got a major problem on their hands where they just cannot get the cut through to reach people because they're sick of hearing about it. But also, in some circumstances, it's it's not working properly. And it's just it's just becoming a bigger disaster by the minute. I this is all going to really back. come to the fore when the next election happens, by the look of it. Um, uh, I, mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I think we've had, we've, we've had our cracks at making the NBN an election issue, and I think it's... Not enough people care, I'm, unfortunately. I'm, I don't yeah, think enough I think people not enough people care. care. But this is the thing that will do it, you see. If you've got 300,000 people plus um, like being told everything's going to be cut off around that sort of time, um, then they'll care. You, look, you could well be right. I was, I was also going to add, though, that I think the other factor that perhaps has people being a bit reticent sitting within that 18 months window is the complexity of plans. Because mm. previously, if you, were, if you were signing up for ADSL or ADSL2, it was just like, I want an internet. Sell me an internet. And you bought your internet, and it came to you at whatever speed you could get. And obviously, as we yeah. know, that's determined by distance and servers and other complex issues. But you had yeah. a single, basically a single package. Um, if you were on cable, you could pay for a bit more, and an awful lot of people didn't. They didn't see the value. They didn't get it. With NBN excluding fixed wireless and satellite, obviously, you have multiple speed tiers, and you have multiple price points. And whilst, you know, I would happily pay for a, a, a full, you know, 100 meg uh NBN connection today, if I could get it, uh, I'm still a couple of years away from that apparently, it's not the case that a lot of people get that and that they get the value of it. And if you go from what are now some very cheap ADSL plans and you look at those 100 meg plans and you think, well, hang on, why do I have to pay twice as much for my NBN? I think there's a certain amount of sticker shock from people who don't kind of realise what all of their full options are. Well, that just about wraps up another episode of Vertical Hold. Remember, if you've got any comments or thoughts about what we've discussed in this episode, hit us up in the comments section on YouTube, via Twitter, or the Facebook Vertical Hold page. Thanks to Nick for joining us. No worries. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And remember, if you like what you hear, hit that subscribe button.
Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Alcatel.